And so we're going to look at biceps tendon. We're going to look at normal. We always begin with normal. Um, tendinosis, tears, and ruptures. It, it's relatively straightforward. There's not a, a difficult uh, concept to, to, to learn here. So we look at uh, the appearance of tendinosis and tenosynovitis, um, what tears look like, what we need to look for, and what, are, what, what do we need to look for in biceps tendon ruptures. Okay, so what we're gonna start with is the tendon anatomy or the proximal anatomy and also look at the scan planes that we're going to use to assess them because the biceps tendon is uh, not a, a straight structure, curves around, so we need to know which scan planes to use. Um, and then we'll look at the normal appearance of the tendon, and then we're going to look at all these uh, abnormalities and what to look for. Okay, so if we start with the anatomy, um, proximally, the long head of biceps tendon arises from the supraglenoid tubicle and the superior labrum. So at the, at the proximal attachment, it attaches both to bone and to labrum. Then we have the intra-articular portion. Um, and then as it becomes extra-articular, it goes into the bicephal groove. So we're going to look at these three regions. And because the tendon runs in different planes, depending on the region that you want to look at, you need to use a different plane. So some planes are better than others. So if we're looking at the proximal portion, the biceps labrum anchor, where, where it attaches, probably the best way to look at that is on the coronal scans, the sagittal images, sorry, the, um, sorry, the coronal scans. Um, if we're looking at the intra-articular portion, then it's predominantly the sagittal images. We can see that on the coronal slices, but um, the, I, I tend to find that the sagittal scans are, are better. And if we're then looking at the bicipital groove, the component of the bicipital groove, you need to be looking at it on the axial scans because it's hard to see it on the other planes. Okay, so what do we look for approximately? So these are coronal scans going from anterior to posterior. Labrum is indicated here, superior labrum. And here's the biceps tendon. And because the biceps tendon curves, you need to follow it on a couple of slices. So you're not, on the coronal scans, you're not going to get it in one single slice. You have to follow it on about three slices or so. So here, anteriorly, we're, we're in the biceps tendon. It hasn't inserted yet. Now we're getting to the insertion into the labrum. And here's the posterior portion of it where it's sort of at the back end of the of the insertion site and we have an insertion both into the labrum and into the supraglenoid region okay what the second portion the intra-articular portion how do we assess that now we can see that on the coronal scan so here's the, here it is on a coronal image here's the labrum this is the biceps tendon but as we said because it curves it actually doesn't go in a straight line we're, we're always scanning either obliquely to it or we just don't have it in full plane. So on the sagittal image, you, you are scanning perpendicular to that intra-articular portion. So it, you get a much better look at the tendon on the sagittal scans. Um, I forgot to mention that in terms of the, the scans, uh, uh, the, um, the sequences we use, we use predominantly PD and PD fat set. The re these are, are PD sequences you get really excellent anatomy with it. The detail is really good, way better than T2. And the PD fat set is basically for signal. So we, it's just a uh, basically PD and PD fat set, but a lot of people use T2. I wouldn't particularly use T1, um, but uh, T2 is fine or a, t or a stir sequence if, um, if you're on a low field strength magnet. And then the third bit is the extra articular portion. Now, this is really assessed best on the axial scan. So this is an axial image. We're cutting through the tendon and you see that really nicely. You can at times see it well on the coronal images as well, uh, but, but I wouldn't rely on this for signal. It's the axial images that you want to look at. Okay, so let's have a, a quick look at um, what normal looks like. So a normal tendon is black. So you can use this pattern for most tendons around the body. Normal tendon is black, it's well-defined, and depending on the tendon, it has a specific, it has a rough size. So the biceps tendon, this is the rough size of it. Um, you shouldn't see signal within the tendon. 
this is the biceps tendon sheath with fluid. Now it's normal to get a little bit of fluid in the tendon sheath. What's, what's, what's a little bit? Well, there's no measurement. It's really the look of it. So here's the, this is a, a, a rough guide to what a normal amount of fluid in a tendon sheath would be. The, the biceps tendon sheath is continuous with the joint space, with the shoulder joint space. So if you have a joint effusion, you can expect to see more fluid within the tendon sheath. And that's not tenosynovitis. So if you see a lot of fluid in the joints, in the tendon sheath, and you think, okay, there may be tenosynovitis, make sure you check the joint space itself and see how much fluid is there. If there's a large effusion, the likelihood is that it will be due to fluid just tracking down into the tendon sheath. Okay, so let's have a, a quick look at the normal signal and also the normal planes. Let's start, let's start maybe with the um, glenoid attachment. So when we look at the intraarticular portion of it, at the glenoid attachment, you can see, you can see how this biceps curves. So we've got a portion of the intraarticular por portion here, then it comes towards the labrum. Here's the labrum. And on the next slice, we've got attachment to labrum and plus it goes over the top of the labrum and attaches to the supraglenoid tubercle. So this portion here, if you're looking for tears, it's best, this attachment to labrum and glenoid is best on, the, on these coronal scans. You can assess the very proximal intraarticular portion um, on the coronal images. So here's the attachment site. You don't really get a good look at it on, the, on these uh, 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 sagittal scans. Again, we're not seeing it well, but then as we, as that ligament, uh, tendon starts to come away from the attachment, then you can start to see it well. So if we're looking for the proximal most portion, it's the coronal images that we need to use. What about the intraarticular portion? So let's look at that again. So here's the intraarticular portion. And as we said, it curves. So you really just don't get a good look at it. So the best way is on these, on these sagittal scans. And here's the tendon. Again, there's one portion as, again, as it curves over the, uh, the humerus, you can see we're starting to scan oblique to it. So here's the tendon sort of curving over. Now we're getting oblique, so it becomes difficult to see. So this is an area where you really need to look at axial, coronal, and sagittals because it's an area that curves. We'd never get it in any plane perpendicular. So you need to look at all three planes. And the importance of this region is that this is a very common spot for tendinosis. So it's easy to miss it here. So you need to look at it in all three planes. Um, the other thing is that, so on the axial um, scans, this is straightforward. So we have a normal tendon within the bicipital groove. It's black. It's, uh, so it's low signal, it's well-defined. We're not seeing any intermediate or high signal within it. This patient has had an arthrogram, and which is the reason why there's so much fluid in that biceps tendon sheath, because it's gone, because it communicates with the joint. The uh, fluid from the arthrogram has just gone into the tendon sheath. So we've looked at the normal appearance of a biceps tendon and also the scan planes that we need to use to assess the various portions of it.